welcome to this GMF discussion on Turkey's relations with the European Union. I'm Karen Donfried, the president of the German Marshall Fund, and I'm delighted to welcome such a terrific group of participants from both sides of the Atlantic to join me in hearing from such an impressive group of speakers. This online event is part of the fellowship program on Turkey, Europe, and global issues launched by GMF in partnership with the Union of Chambers and Commodity Exchanges of Turkey, also known as TOEB, in 2017. Prior to the coronavirus pandemic, we held more than 40 in-person events in Brussels, Washington, Paris, Berlin, and other European capitals, thanks to this GMF TOEB Fellowship. We then had to shift to a virtual platform, and we've been able to keep this important dialogue going. But we do miss sitting in the same room with all of you and catching up over coffee breaks, but we know that will come back. Within the framework of our program, we not only organize events, but we also conduct research and produce publications. Recently, that research has focused on ties between Turkey and the European Union and how to give that relationship fresh impetus. GMF recently conducted two studies as part of its GMF TOBE Fellowship Program. First, the Delphi study focused on the search for a positive agenda for EU-Turkey relations and surveyed a group of experts from Turkey and EU countries regarding the feasibility as well as the potential impact of positive agenda items. Second, the public opinion survey, which was conducted in Turkey, investigated Turkish perceptions of the European Union and of Turkey-EU relations. We are excited to present the survey and the study to you today. I would like to thank sincerely our long-term partner, Tobe, and the president of Tobe, Mr. Rifat Hisargi Gloglu. It has been truly invaluable to GMF to have this support from TOBE, and we've so enjoyed the partnership. Rifat, it is a special privilege to have you with us today. The topic of our conversation today, EU-Turkey relations toward a positive agenda, and we did put a question mark after that, couldn't be more timely. And I first would like to give the floor to the president of TOBE to share with us his perspective on this important issue. So with that, Rifat, over to you. Thank you, Karen. Dear Karen, the president of German Marshall Fund of the United States, Peter Klauer, co-chair EU Turkey Joint Consultative Committee. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to greet you all on behalf of the Union of Chambers and Committee Exchange of Turkey. Let me first congratulate Ms. Karen Donfrey on her nomination of Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs of the United States. Karen, I will I fully believe that you will deserve this nomination and you will make a difference during your term. I wish you success. Secondly, I would like to thank Ian Lesnar and Özgür Ünlü Sarjikli for their excellent work in Turkey transatlantic relations. Within this context, we are happy about our ongoing TOBB GMF joint project. GMF TOBB Fellowship Program on Turkey, Europe, and Global Issues. Let me share brief information about the Union of Chambers and Commodity Exchange of Turkey, namely TOBB. TOBB is the umbrella organization for the business community in Turkey. TOBB has 1.5 million companies as the members of its chamber network. Small, 
medium-sized and large companies from every sector of the economy are represented by the Chamber Network in Turkey. TOBB defends an open and fair trade in a rules-based global system. We promote transparent and predictable business environment. We have built a wide international network. We are represented in many international chamber organizations, such as ICC, Euro Chambers, Confederation of Asia Pacific Chamber of Commerce, Islamic Chamber of Commerce Industry. Currently, I am the Vice President of the Euro Chambers. Together with Peter Clever, I am also the co-chair of the EU-Turkey Joint Consultative Committee. On this occasion, let me also thank Peter Clever for being with us in this important event. Ladies and gentlemen, Turkey and the EU are both partners and allies. Turkey has been targeting the EU membership for almost 60 years. Europe has Turkey's eastern borders. Turkey is the part of the West. Turkey, this is true in terms of security as well as economics. Both Turkey and the EU have managed a lot in economic integration. As the business community, it is our duty to add more positive topics in our long-standing partnership. So for this reason, I would like to thank GMF for their two surveys. The Public Union survey, which was conducted in Turkey on the perceptions of Turkey, Turkish citizens on Europeans, the EU and Turkey-EU relations, and study on EU-Turkey relations in search for a positive agenda. We are happy that, despite political tension, the perception of Turkish citizens of Europeans and the EU are positive, and more than 60% still support Turkey's EU membership. Let me just say that the project of the European integration remains a very critical stage. We, as business organizations, have to be firm and determined in the defense of the idea of European integration. The EU should cover the whole continent, leaving any country which is willing to join the EU and respecting the common values will make the EU project incomplete. The EU should encourage the countries which are willing to EU integration. We should all join forces in the continent and make Europe a global actor. I know that the relations between Turkey and the EU have been backsliding in many aspects. There were always ups and downs for many countries during the accession process. As the, our former president Özal said, the EU membership process is a long and narrow path. So it is wise to focus on positive agenda items during the times, the time of downs. So today, Turkey and the EU should focus on positive agenda items. In fact, as indicated in the GMF survey, there are positive agenda items where we should work together. We have a customs union since 1996. The customs union and close economic contacts with the EU has changed Turkey into a dynamic, industrial, functioning market economy. Current, cur currently, nearly 50% of Turkish exports go to the EU. The EU is the number of one export partner of Turkey. Turkey is the sixth largest trade partner of the EU. I think it's time to move forward with modernization of customs union. This will be good both for Turkey and the EU business. Secondly, the EU Green Deal policy. The EU is working on renovating its existing productive capacity with a new low, low carbon technologies. Turkey needs to make a similar move 
So I think it's time to talk about the Green Deal and the green economy. We see the Green Deal as the new model for the Turkey's economic growth of and transformation. Turkey needs a green, green transformation agenda in line with the EU Green Deal initiative, a mutually beneficial green transformation agenda could be a new positive agenda item between the EU and Turkey. Thirdly, needless, needless to say that Syrian refugees are both topic for Turkey-EU cooperation as positive agenda item. Moreover, the visa dialogue, which will lead waiving the visa obligations on the Turkish citizens, will be another major positive contribution to the EU Turkey positive agenda. I would like to conclude that the business community of Turkey has been always supporting Turkey's EU membership. We consider this is a mutual benefit for Turkey and the EU. Anything we can do to do make this possible will be strongly supported. Thank you very much once again for being with us and listening to me. Thanks, Karen. Thank you so much, Rifat. And, and first, I appreciate your congratulations to me. And I'm very honored by the president's announcing his intent to nominate me for that position. And I just want to underscore the critical role that the US Senate plays in this process and, and in terms of the confirmation. Uh, so we'll see how this all moves forward. I really appreciated your substantive remarks about Turkey's relationship with the European Union. And one of the core missions that unites DMF and TOEB is how you framed your remarks, which is this deep commitment to free and fair trade in a rules-based system. And I do think that's so fundamental to the countries involved here, Turkey, US, and, and the countries in the European Union and how we move forward on this agenda. And those two points you highlighted that could be at the core of a positive agenda, the modernization of the existing customs union and how Turkey and the EU can work together on a green agenda, I think are really powerful points. And what I'd love to do now is bring in Peter Cleaver, who is the co-chair of the EU-Turkey Joint Consultative Committee. And Peter, we'd love to hear your perspective on this set of issues. So let me give the floor to you. Peter, open your microphone. I thought it was done by the host, you see, in the, in the system. Now you can hear me, I hope. Okay. So first, I, I want to join, of course, the congrats to you, Karen. Uh, I know the nomination by the President of the United States is only, only the first step, but each journey starts with the first step, and it's the most important, I guess. And uh, we think there is uh, no reasonable doubt uh, which could be expressed about your competence for this outstanding position. We know the German Marshall Fund of the United States suffers a great loss indeed, but it's more than offset by the added competence and practical experience in the US State Department once the Senate uh, uh, approves you and your nomination. And we will have a reliable and prudent friend there in the State Department in the future. And with that prudent and reliable friend, I've already found the bridge to our event today because it shows both competence and prudence to bring representatives from Turkey and the European Union together for discussion right now. The signs from politics point to de-escalation. This is encouraging especially civil societies, civil societies which want nothing more than peace, peace both internally and externally. Economies that are prosperous on both sides and lively exchange among peoples. Nor was it the civil societies that turned official relations around for the worse through provocations and unlawful behavior 
but let's look ahead with optimism. I cannot cover the wide range of things that need to be discussed and then improved in our official, official relationships. I just want to pick out one central aspect that is particularly important to me. For the last third of my working life, I was representative of business until I retired. For Germany as an industrial nation that is closely linked to the global economy, the same basic question questions always arise. Where can company do best business? Where is it possible to keep the most extensive business relationships stable and let them grow for mutual benefit? And where are the good business relationships also promising in the long term? This is the case wherever and as long as there is democracy with freedom of assembly, freedom of expression, and protection of minorities from discrimination, and where the rule of law applies. So where courts are only obliged to national and international law, and independent judges make their judgments regardless of any influence of the executive. So when the Commission President, EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen declares that human rights and the rule of law are not negotiable, this is not only a legal, a political, a moral position, but also deeply a position geared towards prosperous economic relationships. And it's not up to the states to respect human rights. We have all made an official and legally binding commitment to do so. The European Council's Human Rights Convention is binding on us. That is why I was particularly pleased when I was able to read the following result of the representative opinion poll by GMF in Turkey yesterday evening. Among the international organizations in Turkish society, the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg has by far the greatest support. I began my brief introductory remarks with the signals of de-escalation from politics, which so far mainly have been expressed in words. But words must also be followed by actions if we want to come to new forward-looking agreements between the European Union and Turkey. And it's now up to President Erdogan to respect and implement the final rulings of the European Court of Human Rights. The Turkish president can be sure of the trust his own people have in this court. That could be an unfortunate signal that we are on the right track to improve official relations. This would bring the positive feelings of Turkish people for Europe into better harmony with the state agreements. And I think we can, on this background, discuss all the aspects Rifat also mentioned, the aspects on free movement, refugees, uh, on, on a customs union, on people to people, high level dialogue, whatever you want to discuss but really it must be based on the acknowledgement of our commitment to human rights and ruling of law. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Peter. I think it was critical for you to remind us that foundational to the Turkish EU relationship is the importance of democracy and democratic principles from rule of law to respect for human rights. And what we now want to do is, is, with those opening statements in mind, move to a broader discussion. And I am going to turn to my wonderful colleague, Ian Lesser, who's going to moderate that discussion. And I certainly am looking forward to it. Ian is really the front man of a wonderful band of GMF colleagues. That includes Kadri and Anika in Brussels, the dynamic duo of Uzgur and Ceylon in Ankara, and behind the scenes, Alberto, who is providing the technical support. 
Uh, so I am going to turn to that front man, Ian, and have him take us to the next session, the panel. Over to you, Ian. Thank you. Well, Karen, thank you very, very much. And uh, it's so good to be here. It's so good to be here with uh, friends of GMF. And let me add my thanks, Rifat Bey, to, to you and to TOBB for our ongoing cooperation. It has been you know, the basis for so much wonderful work that we've done together uh, over the years and are doing uh, both conversations and research. And I think you know, one of the, the sort of uh, maybe neglected bright points of this strange COVID environment we find ourselves in is that uh, among the many terrible things going on also, at least in the context of our work, it's also allowed a bit more time to have uh, you know, a sort of active research agenda alongside the convening. Uh, and that's, that's really great. And it's great that we're able to share some of those results with you today, but also to have a discussion around them. And so just to give you a little bit of a roadmap as to what we were planning um, in that regard, I was going to ask my colleague Kadri, um, a senior fellow with us for the TOG program in Brussels, uh, to sort of lead off and, and talk a bit about the findings. And then we will have a, a conversation uh, that will also include Senem Aydin Duzigit, who's professor of international relations at Sabanja University, and also Gunter Seifert, who's the director of the Center for Applied Turkish Studies at SWP in Berlin. And uh, lots to talk about, but I am gonna go straight to Kadri to have us tell us more about the findings from the two research activities we've had underway. So Kadri, thanks so much and over to you. Thank you, thank you so much Ian. Uh, hello everyone. It's also a great pleasure for me uh, that we are able to present to you these two uh, uh, studies, the survey uh, on public opinion and also a Delphi study uh, with you. I will just ask you all to be a bit patient because it will take almost 15, 20 minutes to present. Actually, we shorten a lot the, the, the findings, but it's still, it will still take a bit time. So uh, I apologize for this and I will share my screen and to present the, the, the results uh, with you. Yeah, so first of all, the, the survey that has been carried out actually uh, in Turkey, and this survey has been carried out in March and in April with 2006 participants representing the group age of uh, 18 and above in the 29 provinces in Turkey via uh, a face to face uh, interview. Uh, interview. So uh, some finding just very fast on the on the foreign policy first. And as you can see, when we ask uh, the two, the Turkey's most important partners, and uh, we saw that 46% of the respondent uh, mentioned Azerbaijan, followed by Russia uh, with 18.6%, followed by Germany with 13.5%. Then when we asked the biggest threat to the Turkish national interest, actually we saw that the, uh, with 60% uh, of the respondents, they mentioned the United States, uh, followed by Israel with the 24 and Russia with 19%. And then again, when we, should, when we ask should, whom should Turkey cooperate most closely with on international issues, we saw that actually 37% of the, the, the public uh, that's responding mentioned countries of European Union. And you can see that actually for the 1824 uh, uh, age group is even higher, is 32 person. And Russia is coming as a second country that the, the Turkey should uh, cooperate most closely. And some perception on the European Union, and you, kiss, you can see that actually Despite those results that I have just shown you, that actually the opinion regarding Turkey's EU membership is, is still really, really positive. Actually, the, 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 the 50, almost 56% of the respondents think that the Turkey's EU membership is a, is a good thing. And for the young age group, it's almost 66%. And we, when we ask, if there was a hypothetical referendum on Turkey's EU membership this Sunday, we see that actually 60% of the respondents, that they will, they will vote yes. And for the young group is even higher, is almost 69%. 
And when, whereas when we ask when will Turkey become a full member of the EU, you can see that actually almost 38% of the respondents said that the Turkey will never become uh, a full member of European Union. Only 19% thinks that maybe not before 15 years. An attitude toward, toward the Europeans is still very positive, as you can see that almost uh, 16, 69% of the respondents, uh, they have a really uh, positive attitude toward the Europeans and for the young generation, for the uh, 18, 24 age group is almost is 72%. And we also ask if, uh, again, opinion regarding Turkey's membership, we see that actually 52%, the majority, think that actually European Union does not have the intention to letting Turkey in, is just trying to delay the accession process. Only 23% think that Turkey is not ready for the EU membership, even if EU is willing to admit Turkey right away. And the 21.5% thinks that if Turkey accomplished the task as required, it can easily join the European Union. And we are also ask which factors do, could facilitate Turkey's full membership. Uh, as you can see, we, to, we ask two responses here, and we see we can see that 59 persons mentioned economic improvement in Turkey, uh, for, 47 persons mentioned improvement on, of, uh, in human rights, and 29.8 mentioned legal reforms in Turkey. And when we ask the most important benefits of Turkey's EU accession for Turkey, as you can see that the 19 persons uh, mentioned improvement of economy, 17.5 persons uh, mentioned increase of Turkey's power in the international arena, arena and 17 persons mentioned improvement of democracy. But here, just let me to mention that actually for the youngs, improvement of democracy seems to be the uh, the, the, the factors that will most uh, benefit uh, of uh, benefit Turkey for if it's uh, access to the European Union. And here we, we also ask a level of, uh, and we can see the level of approval for changes that Turkey adopted in the past or may adopt to ensure the EU accession process. And we can see that the 47% uh, of the participants, they they uh, agree. Uh, I mean, they they agree that establish of uh, about establishment of necessary conditions for freedom of thought and freedom of expression. Forty one percent they agree with the establishment of conditions necessary for expression of freedom of religion. Forty percent they they agree with the abolition of laws uh, laws prohibiting education uh, in the native la native sorry languages of citizen. Uh, 30, uh, almost 40 percent uh, agree on abolition of laws prohibiting radio and television broadcasts in the native languages, but only 27.9 percent approve abolition of capital punishment, and almost 24.4 percent uh, do not uh, approve. And 20, almost 21 percent approve the solution of problems with Greece by means of mutual compromises, but. 29% do not approve this. And only 19.7% approve the solution of existing, existing problems in Cyprus by means of mutual compromises, but 29% uh, do not uh, approve this. And we also listed some opinion regarding, uh, regarding Europe. And uh, we saw that actually 70% uh, of uh, uh, participants, they really believe that Europe has assisted strengthening of, a, of organizations such as PKK in Turkey. 67.9% per, per, uh, percent of the participants believe that European countries are willing to divide and disintegrate Turkey, just like they did uh, to the Ottoman Empire in the past. 61.8% believe what is what is behind the European attitudes against Turkey is the crusader spirit. 60% uh, believe that the westernization efforts in Turkey could not go beyond Western mimicry. And uh, almost 60% believe that the reform conducted for EU-Turkey 
EU accessions are no different than the capitulations. And 56.4% believe that the reforms demanded from Turkey by the EU are similar to ones mentioned in several treaty in the past. And when we ask if uh, actually custom union benefited to Turkey, and then actually the majority of the participants, they don't have an answer or they don't know, but 33.8% uh, think that this is beneficial for Turkey. And when we ask if the uh, services, public procurement and agriculture sector should be included in the custom union, we can see that the support is almost as 44%. And when we ask about some foreign policy issues and we ask if, the, uh, if they think that Turkey has common or contradicting interests with Europe on these issues, and you can see that on the refugee problem, ISMAT, Eastern Mediterranean tension, civil war in Syria, fight against ISIS or Cyprus issue and civil war in Libya. And the majority of those issues, the, the actually the, almost the majority of the participants or the plurality think that the, 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 the Turkey's and the EU's interests are contradicting on these issues. And when we ask, uh, some actions that could potentially improve relations between Turkey and the European Union through three answer, answers. We, 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 uh, almost 53 persons mentioned liberalization of visa regime, uh, 50 persons mentioned cooperation in fight against terrorism, and 45 mentioned cooperation on migration issues. And when we ask Actually, as the Turkey has to fulfill uh, remaining C criteria in order to conclude a visa liberalization agreement with the European Union. And so we ask actually about those criteria to the uh, participant, if they support or they oppose of the fulfillment of those criteria. We see that actually the majority of the case, the, they support it. I, I mean, 52.7% uh, approved the ensuring uh, on, uh, uh, ensuring effective judicial cooperation with all member states on criminal matters, 50, almost 52 percent approved the review of the legislation and practice on terrorism in light of European standard, almost 51 percent approved harmonization of the legislation on the protection of personal data with the EU standards, uh, 50 percent uh, adopt, uh, sorry, uh, approve adopting the measure for preventing corruption. 48% uh, approve the conclusion of an operational cooperation agreement between Turkey and Europol, and 48% approve the full implementation of the EU Turkey readmission agreement. And we also asked some question about uh, uh, climate change and, um, uh, and environment, and you can see that actually we asked. Uh, we gave them two opinions and we asked their, uh, uh, which, which one of this is closer to their uh, view. Actually, we saw that 70% of the participants, they, they agree with the, uh, the, the, view, the view that environmental protection should be prioritized, even if it costs slow economic growth and job losses. And only 23% are agree with the, the idea that even if the environment is harmed, creating economic growth and job opportunities should be a priority. And when we ask uh, about the Paris climate agreement, and we ask if Turkish parliament should ratify the, uh, and we can see that the majority, almost 66 part, uh, percent of the participants, they, they think that it should ratify the, for the young and the age of 1824 uh, is almost 70 percent. And we also ask, of their opinion regarding Turkey joining the EU Green Deal. And we can see that actually the majority uh, think that Turkey should join the EU Green Deal. Thank you so much for listening to me. I will just briefly uh, present you also our second, uh, I promise you it will be, uh, uh, it will just last five minutes, four or five minutes. Uh, we'll not uh, present you all the details because otherwise it will be uh, so long. Uh, actually, with this, sorry. Oh, sorry. Can I? Um, I don't know. I, I don't know if you can see it, Ian, but I have a. 
So problem with that. I would just, sorry, I would just Thank try you. again. It's, it's quite it's working, working, actually. Yeah, actually me, I couldn't see it strangely. <laughs> I could. So this is a problem if I cannot see it. Uh, yeah. So yes, actually uh, with this uh, uh, Delphi study, uh, through three steps, actually, the Delphi study, so we surveyed more than 50 people, actually, participants, half of them from European countries and half of them are from uh, Turkey. Actually, it included expert, former uh, policymakers, government official and opinion makers. Actually, 50 is quite a high number for this kind of study, I may say. Let me to, just to say some word about the uh, about the method, actually it has two components. Uh, the first one is positive agenda item. Actually in the first round of this exercise, participants are asked to list some positive agenda items for EU-Turkey relations. And answer given to this open-end question have been analyzed and recorded to the 15 different items. And the second component of this policy, pro uh, uh, of this study's policy proposal, for this component, we listed seven policy area that may positively contribute to the EU-Turkey relation and ask participants whether they are for or against this policy. And in the second phase, we presented the result of the first round and we asked participants to rank these policies and items according to their importance. And in the third phase, participants re-rank these items and policy according to their importance importance and they, they also rated them based on their feasibility. Very, very briefly, some positive item, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, agenda items. Here you can see actually the importance and the feasibility of map of positive agenda items that we received from the participant from Turkey. And you can see on the upper right pattern two uh, major it uh, items, migration, cooperation, and the costume union seems to be uh, the, mo the most important uh, uh, and the feasible uh, uh, items for EU-Turkey relations. Even if cooperation on foreign policy and security and the visa liberalization seems to be important for the participant from Turkey, but unfortunately their uh, feasibility is, <coughs> is, sorry, is not very high. And you can see on the upper uh, uh, left uh, quadrant cooperation on research and development, intensified human education and scientific exchange, civil society engagement, high level dialogue, uh, meetings and summits are, uh, their feasibility is quite high, but uh, they don't, they are not the most important for uh, the, the participant from Turkey. And in this, one, in this map, we can see the importance, uh, uh, the important items for the European participant. Unfortunately, the, there is only one topic that is, is important and also feasible for the European participant, which is mig migration cooperation. Of course, for the European participation, also the custom union modernization and also cooperation on foreign policy and security are important issues, but their feasibility doesn't seem high for them. And when it's come to the policies, actually, you can see that the, the custom union modernization, the, the revision of legislation, the Turkish legislation and practice on terrorism in line with the European standard and the migration cooperation, EU financial assistance to, to Turkey for decarbonization of, it, of its economy, visa liberals, visa regime, etc. They are actually the, the, the participant from Turkey and the Europe, they approve all this policy uh, proposal. But here you can see on the left upper side that actually the Europeans participant, they are also uh, approve uh, the, the Turkey's EU accession process uh, is replaced by a new framework, which is not approved by the Turkish participant. And you can also see the democratization of Turkish political sh uh, should for both sides should continue to be a, a prerequisite for advancing the relations. And here we can see the feasibility and importance of those policy. We can see again, actually for the participant from Turkey, the, the migration cooperation and the custom union modernization seems to be two important policy proposals that are important and also feasible. 
And in, the, in this one, again, for the Europeans, uh, we have almost the, uh, the same results. The, the, the migration cooperation and the cost of union modernization seems to be the most important and feasible policy proposal. And for the, for the Europeans, this the revision of legislation and uh, Turkish legislation and practice on the terrorism in light with the European standards seems to be important, but its feasibility doesn't seem high. Thank you so much for listening me. Ian, over to you. Audrey, thanks to you very much for what was really very concise, in fact, and had an enormous amount to tell us on many, very different fronts. I mean, we're going to have an opportunity now to discuss uh, some of the findings and other questions that could come up in our conversation. Let me also mention that we're also going to, we have a lot of people uh, on the line with us, and we're going to have an opportunity at the end uh, for Q&A coming from our virtual audience. And so if you would use the Q&A function uh, to ask questions, and we'll try to get to quite a number of those. Some have already come in. So please keep that in mind as you're listening. Um, you know, I'm, I'm gonna to turn to our two discussants, but you know, allow me just you know, two comments if I could. I mean, one, I, this extremely interesting studies with, with results that in a way are not surprising, but there, there really are some very striking things in there when you think about it from a transatlantic perspective, which is you know, rather natural for GMF. Um, you know, when you look at the range of issues that go into this Turkey-EU relationship, you can't help but be struck by simply the, the complexity, the diversity, the number of options and things that policymakers and public can think about in trying to envision the future of the relationship. For the United States and Turkey, it's a much narrower base of things. And and, and I think for that reason, in some ways, much, much tougher. The EU and Turkey, if you think about a positive agenda, there are a lot of things that may not be easy, but there's a lot to think about and there's a lot that's possible. And, and they're in different sectors as, you, as you've displayed. Um, the second point, um, it strikes me as kind of obvious on all sides of the relationship, but also very critical. And that is, but also hard, hard perhaps to, to get one's, um, head around quite so easily. And that's the, the problem of mistrust uh, and, and not to say suspicion in many, in many ways. Um, you, you see practical uh, interests in a positive agenda coming from all sides, especially among the youth, it's very interesting. Uh, but you know, that very first slide you showed us is rather disturbing, especially for an American observer to look at, but not just for an American observer, I think. Um, just the depth of suspicion. And, you know, maybe in our conversation, we can talk a little bit at some point about, you know, how do you fix that? What's the positive agenda around that problem, which is historical, cultural, psychological, even maybe, but also requires some work. So, uh, but that's just as preamble. Uh, we're really delighted again to have our discussants uh, with us. And uh, Sam, maybe if I could turn to you first for some some comments um, on any of the things perhaps that I just mentioned, but I'm sure things occurred to you when you saw the results. And then, then we'll go to you, Gunter. Please. Senem Hocam, I, am, I really apologize, Ian. I have just an announcement to do because I have just received a message. Actually, Mr. Hisarcıklıoğlu will be obliged to leave because it, actually there is a curfew in Turkey that's starting at, there is a 17 days lockdown in Turkey. And I think he has the two other meetings just before the curfew. And he will be obliged to leave very soon. And he, if he has something to say before, and I really apologize, Senem Hocam. No, no, Kadri, thank you for mentioning it. Yeah, and Rifat sure. Bey, it's perfectly understood, of course. Uh, what could be more important than that? So uh, our thanks to you again. But if you'd like a last word on anything, please, by all means. Thank you very much. Hope to see you uh, face to face. That, that would be a pleasure. That would be a pleasure. Bye bye. Thanks. Sorry again, Senem Hocam, go ahead. Senem, go ahead, please. Okay, well, thank you very much. And thanks very much, Ian, um, and to Karen for the warm introduction. Now, I'm going to be brief, but there are six very brief points I'd like to make um, on the basis of what I've been reading uh, from the survey results and also uh, the results of the Delphi Elite survey as well. Now I had a look at the, I've had a chance to go through these in depth when Kadri kindly uh, sent them to me uh, yesterday evening. And there are certain things that are quite striking. The first thing that I, that I find that's interesting is that societal perceptions on 
cooperation with Russia, more favorable societal perceptions on cooperation with Russia seem to be growing. Now, of course, we don't have a comparative historical analysis as such, but I um, believe that, you know, usually, historically, um, societally, there is a lot of anxiety about cooperating with Russia. There's not exactly a Russia phobia that you'd see in some places, Central and Eastern Europe, but Turkish society is usually very skeptical of uh, pro-Russian initiatives. But now I think we see that the cooperation, or at least these data suggest, that the cooperation that's been happening at the very top somehow has found a way of trickling down to the society, at least across some segments of the public. And I think that's something important to watch, not just for Turkey-EU relations, but I think for Turkish-US relations as well. And, and I wanted to note that at the start. Now, secondly, again, on Russia, that's, I mean, I don't want to talk too much about Russia, but I think this is interesting. On the Russian question, there seems to be also a similar amount of, amount of people who perceive Russia as a danger or a threat. So that also makes me feel or believe that the polarization that we are observing in Turkey at the domestic scale somehow has made its way into uh, perceptions on who to cooperate with as well. And I think, you know, Russia might be uh, one foreign policy actor over which this is manifested. Now, of course, when you look at sentiments towards America, you know, it's quite upsetting to see that anti-Americanism is still very high in Turkey. And uh, as opposed to perhaps view on Russia or elsewhere, it, it seems to gather support across political parties, because I think the number was around something like 60%, which of course is much more than what uh, the current governing coalition currently has in terms of support in Turkey. So I think uh, this is also something uh, to, to watch for. Now, a third point is, I think, this emphasis on the youth. I mean, you brought it up, Ian, and um, in the introductory speeches, it was mentioned as well. I mean, I think the youth, uh, the 18, 24-year-olds, as, as, as it's been observed, uh, seems to favor a much closer relationship with Europe, seem to uh, favor um, you know, Turkish membership of the EU more, et cetera, et cetera. And what's interesting here, and not just for the youth, but for the overall society, is that this demand for democracy and human rights seems to make it at the top three of the agenda of cooperation with the EU. Whereas, for instance, free movement, which is something that we know that Europeans are quite anxious about, is at the bottom, right? And I think this is important to show that within Turkey, there are, there's a considerable segment of Turkish society that still looks up to the European Union as a normative actor. And this is an important message for EU and EU's external relations as well. And of course, one has to say that this is very closely related to what we've been experiencing in terms of regression of democracy and fundamental freedoms within Turkey too. So this has to be, I think, read in this larger frame uh, of events. Uh, and I think the same goes for this high support for the European Court of Human Rights, which uh, Peter Kleber uh, rightly alluded to at his opening speech. I think this is very important. And I don't think this is something you would have from the Turkish public, say, 20 or 30 years ago. I think you would see something completely opposite, you know, at the time. Whereas now, I think the reason why, one of the reasons, at least, I mean, I'm speculating here, of course, I haven't seen the actual data behind these results, but it seems to me as if um, it has to do with the fact that people are increasingly looking up to these international institutions, uh, like the EU, but also like the European Court of Human Rights, for democracy, human rights, and liberties in the cases where the domestic political setup and the domestic restraints on freedom of expression and other fundamental uh, freedoms are becoming increasingly more limited. I think this is important for EU, but I think it's also important for US foreign policy, for this new US administration, which is uh, placing a lot of emphasis on multilateralism and international democracy and the importance of in international institutions uh, to that end. So I think that's also important. Now, a fourth point is, um, you know, zooming in a bit more on Europe. Um, I think among all of the other EU countries, Germany seems to stand out as uh, the one, you know, which uh, Turkish society seems to accord the most importance to in its dealings with Europe. Of course, one can argue that economic and societal relationships with Germany and the presence of Euro Turks in Germany uh, has a lot of uh, role to play in this. But it's interesting that even in terms of cultural affinity, 
Germany tops the list. So it's not Greece, for instance, where I guess geopolitical issues at the macro level seem to have an influence and these kind of cultural and societal perceptions as well, but Germany that uh, tops the list. So I thought that was also interesting. Now, um, another point is that while, of course, there are there is you know some sort of positive um, takes to take to 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 watch for in uh, in all this data, it's also quite I think revealing that there still seems to be rather limited knowledge of the EU across the Turkish public. So they seem to be supporting Turkish accession to the EU or you know, generally favorable towards closer relationships. But when they're asked, for instance, who support Turkish accession most in the EU, they say France and Germany. So that also goes to show that they're not really into the, the, the debates that are going on, which, and which is understandable because these things don't make it to the news so much uh, these days um, in Turkey. Um, now, and my final um, two points, maybe. One is um, when you look at these numbers, it shows that the Turkish public is willing for their governments to undertake steps in democracy, including you know, minority rights, to uh, you know, meet EU demands and to become an EU member one day. But it seems that their support for making concessions um, regarding Turkey's relations with Greece or on the Cyprus issue seems to go down to around 20% or so. So that seems to be at the bottom of the list. Now that is important, I think, especially for the EU to consider before, for instance, linking the Cyprus issue. And I think we've now heard today that the recent talks have also failed, which is, wasn't very unexpected, I presume. Um, but, you know, tying it all to the Cyprus issue, like tying even the revitalization of the customs union agreement, which has been mentioned uh, by the previous speakers to this uh, is a resolution of the Cyprus issue, because, you know, um, any government, the current one, but also any future government, I think will be restrained by, uh, by the public opinion on this one, at least that's what the data uh, suggests. Um, final note, uh, one on the more negative side, but you know, I want to finish on the positive, so that's what I'm going to um, finish. Um, of course, the so-called Sevre syndrome that we talk about a lot in Turkey, that is the fear of partition of Turkey territorially by foreign powers, in particular by Western powers, unfortunately still seems to be high. There seems to be about half, almost half of the population that fears that, but Silver lining, it seems to be less pronounced among the youth than it is in the older generations. Also, another um, interesting take uh, that, that I noticed is that, for instance, if you focus on EU-Turkey cooperation, you see that cooperation on certain policy issues, like refugee issue, you know, migration or fight against ISIS, etc., they're not reflected on societal attitudes. The society thinks that, you know, the majority thinks that there are huge divergences of opinion between EU and Turkey on these issues, whereas in fact, these are probably the only issues that the EU and Turkey seems to be effectively collaborating on. So I thought that's also quite puzzling. And on my uh, more positive finishing note, I'd like to mention the environment and this issue of climate change. As you know, Turkey still has not ratified the Paris Agreement. And I don't think there is any reason whatsoever left for Turkey not to ratify it, given that 60% of the Turkish public supports its ratification. Um, so that's an overwhelming majority. And it also goes to show that when you put it as economic growth versus the environment and climate change, the public and especially the youth want to go for the environment. And in fact, I think, I mean, the question is wonderful, but perhaps, you know, it would be, you know, you know, when we talk about environment and climate change, it's uh, perhaps better instead of, you know, contracting it with growth to put it together in a more mutual relationship with employment as well, which, in my opinion, that would also increase the positive sentiment further across uh, society. But that goes to show that if Turkey ever pursues the Green Deal or being part of this European Green Agenda and the overall global uh, change in global climate regime, um, then there will be um, significant societal support to go ahead with that. And I think that could be one way through which the current political struggles in Turkey um, could somehow, 
you know, find um, a way of resolving themselves in the future by being firm on a green agenda and by projecting a future uh, political setup by the uh, political parties, but also by the policymakers um, in that context and in close cooperation with the European Union as well. And I think I'm going to um, finish at that and maybe come in later if there are any questions. Tatum, thank you very much. And absolutely, there will be opportunities to do this. And, and, and Peter, uh, you're with us. I mean, please, if there are things that you'd like to come in with, uh, I'm going to turn to Gunter. But if you have thoughts on any of this, please uh, don't hesitate and uh, just, just let us know. Um, you know, thank you for that, Tatum. I mean, you raised a lot of issues that, in a way, play off of the findings and, and what Kadri has told us. I mean, one of the things that occurred to me, and Gunter, perhaps you could maybe even reflect on this in your own comments. Is it, are we really heading you know, towards something that used to be called and not liked as that description, privileged partnership? Um, and if that's where we're going with all of this, uh, what is lost? And I think, Sinem, in your comments, you give us maybe a little bit of a hint about that in terms of um, this sort of drive for convergence, especially in the values area on whether it's democracy or media freedom or other things which large segments of the Turkish public do indeed care about. Is that lost? Do you give that up by going the privileged partnership route, the kind of strategic practical cooperation part, um, whatever we, vocabulary we use for it? But Gunter, let me, let me turn to you for some reflections of your own. Please, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. And uh, also thank you for the invitation and for the possibility uh, to contribute. Uh, Starting with, with your uh, question, Ian, I think Turkey is already in a privileged par partnership with Europe. We know it's the only country with which, uh, with which uh, Europe is uh, undertaking or cooperating in the frame of a customs union. And I think it's the only country in the region in which, with which Europe is really trying to establish not closer economic cooperation, but also uh, security cooperation. And, uh, Turkey is the only non-European country, I think maybe in the, in the future it will be also Britain, uh, where there is a consciousness in Europe that security policy and foreign policy has to reflect on Turkey's stance and has to try to integrate Turkey in these kind of policies. But if we now come to, uh, to, the, to the results of, of, of the study, I will, not I will not talk about uh, the Delphi study because as you also said, uh, Ian, or uh, I think it was Kadri, was that it was not really surprising what, what came out. For me, the uh, study on the perception of uh, the EU by the Turkish population is, is much more interesting. And I would, would first uh, agree with what Sinem, what, what Sinem said, that uh, there is a change uh, in what is expected by uh, a, policy, a, 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 poly, a membership in the European Union once it happens, if it happens once. Uh, in former times, there was always uh, free travel and these kind of things. And sometimes I, I remember a couple of years ago, a friend of mine said, for the Turkish population, European integration or your membership in the European Union means to be, it, 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 will, it will be realized in Europe by way of, of free travel. And today we see a shift in the emphasis that membership in the European Union will be realized in Turkey by changes in the Turkish, in the Turkish uh, political system. At least these are the expectations of a, of a large part of, of society. But to put, a, to put a, a critical note, maybe not a critical note, but also I think naturally the results uh, inform us about, uh, about the views of uh, the Turkish population on Europe. But I think these um, questions or the question, how much would you uh, enjoy or how much would, would you approve membership in Europe when we look at, at, at the time at, or at research in different times, I think it's also an indicator of how optimistic the Turkish, populist, the Turkish population uh, is at the moment on its own political future in a given political situation. I remember that in 2011, uh, when, Turk, when there was a very optimistic climate in Turkey, when Turkey was perceived as a, a role model for the whole Middle East, when Turkey was in a way in the midst of its economic uh, development, then uh, the readiness to, um, to approve membership in the European Union was down to 40%, down at 40%. And uh, the same is true when we look at uh, trends in different parties. We all know that in the first decade of the, EU, of the AKP ruling, uh, there was great resistance 
of European membership, or let's say less support of you for European membership under the voters of the GHP, of the Rep Republican People's Party, because uh, the reforms demanded by the European Union at that time were to weaken what the AKP called the Kemalist establishment and the tutelage of the Kemalist state over the elected government. And uh, today we see a quite a different picture. Now it's, and at that time, it was the AKP votership that in the majority voted or expressed its willingness to join the European Union. And today we see it's quite the opposite that now the GHB voters in her majority, in their majority vote for uh, European membership, whereas the AKP voters are uh, skeptical. And therefore only a remark, these results tell us a lot about the view on Europe, but it tell us, they tell us also a lot about, about how different segments of Turkish society uh, perceive their own situation and how optimistic they are on the future. Uh, now, when it comes to, to the results uh, as such, I think there is a clear tendency on more EU compatible attitudes uh, amongst the younger generation. And this is a very positive picture. But again, I would not uh, overestimate it because the differences between the average and the younger generation, uh, it varies between five and 10%. And therefore there is a clear tendency, but we cannot talk about uh, a complete or reorientation of, of, of the use. We may not talk about a kind of generation conflict uh, in, 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 in political attitudes. And therefore there is hope, but we should not overestimate it. Uh, what me strikes at most, I think it's extremely difficult to interpret the findings uh, and to make sense of, of data that presents both an absolute majority for EU membership and a large relative majority valuing Europe and European countries as the most appropriate cooperation partners, co cooperation partners for Turkey. And at the same time, a large absolute majority, up to 70%, that fears hidden agendas of Europe as such as supporting terrorists, dividing Turkey and demanding reform similar to the capitulations in the Ottoman Empire. And when, when the Ottoman Empire had been subject to European colonial powers. And how to, how to interpret these, these uh, contradictory uh, results? And I see, I see two, two uh, ways to, to understand this. Uh, one would be to talk about a split uh, in the individual's perceptions, a split between the perception in the realm of the personal, social, and economic life. And uh, where we see that the perception of the, of the own situation and also of the, of the political sit situation is more based on personal experience and a perception of threat to state and nation that seems to be closely related to the overall nationalist and conservative worldview that is conveyed to the population by official education, extremely polarized political discourses and the nationalist conservative mainstream media today. And on the other hand, I think another, another uh, alternative to read this would say uh, that what I would, would would, make, would be to, to really to accept that we are facing a deeply polarized, uh, politically polarized society divided into almost one half whose political orientation is constructed more on the basis of personal experience again in social, economic and uh, occupational life and that opts for a more, more European way of life and another half of the population who grasps their reality mostly in concepts thoughts and theorems that dominate the often highly ideologically colored political structure. Now, what a last, a last remark, what some very small remarks, what does this tell us? This, uh, in a way, ambiguous picture. What does this tell us for the need of European policy? And I think it tells us that the European Union is still anchored, is still needed as an anchor uh, for uh, political um, developments in Turkey, as Senem also put it, that there is still a need for a normative, for Europe as a normative actor. Because what we see, this uh, contrasting picture allows both, or it shows both the potential for democratic developments, but it also shows the potential of a hardening of an authoritarian regime. And therefore, I think Europe has to be aware that it is still needed as a, as a, as a, as a guiding 
as, a, as an actor that is not only uh, acting in a transactional way to its own benefit, but also has to take uh, in mind uh, or has to keep in mind that uh, it is needed for a more positive uh, development in Turkey because a more and more authoritarian Turkey is also a real challenge for Europe. But we see that the European Union, and I'm, I'm sure we will discuss this later, until now has not been very successful in its, in its policy towards Turkey. Uh, and it has lost its leverage that was part of the um, membership process. And we saw uh, in the last months that it was extremely difficult for Europe to formulate, to formulate a new policy towards Turkey. And this was due to the different national interests of EU member states, but it was also true due to different climates in the political institutions of Europe, in the parliament, in the commission, and uh, in the uh, Council of Europe. And the question is now, if, as my last sentence, if with the last conclusions of the European uh, Council, that in a way uh, talked about uh, a more a phased, proportionate, and reversible policy towards Turkey, and that binds this policy on particular conditions Turkey has to, has to fulfill. The question is, if with this kind of policy, Europe is able to establish a new conditionality towards Turkey with a normative aspect, aspect beyond an, a conditionality beyond the accession process. And I think we, we should have to discuss this later. Thank you. Good to thank you very much indeed. Um, there is an awful lot on the table. I do want to get to a lot of the questions that have come in, and there have been quite a few. Uh, again, you can use the Q&A function. Uh, but before I do that, I just very briefly, Peter, if you had anything that you wanted to, don't, don't feel obliged. But if you have a, a brief comment on what you've heard, by all means, do share. Yes, th thank you. I have a comment and, and, uh, and a question. Uh, my comment is that there is, of course, not a split between the society and the younger people, 18 to 24, but the promising attitudes uh, are strengthened by the youth. And this is what I really find promising for, for our relationship, not in, 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 uh, in a sense that the society should be split, and I don't want to to refer just to the young people, because we have to convince all people that we want really a, a good relationship and, and an open way, which really once can lead to membership. I personally changed my, 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 my position on that. Uh, I, I preferred to be honest, as I said in, in former times, let's be honest that uh, a, a preferential relationship is the realistic way. But I think if we look to a long term, I think that uh, that changes in, in Turkish politics uh, are possible and are supported by society, which are prerequisite for, for EU membership. So we should not give up the, the goal. So uh, I think this is really promising. My question is, if, if I look to the, to the chart, it's chart number seven, sentiments toward other countries. I see a ranking with positive sentiments and negative, but the but there are is, there is a big 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 majority of negative sentiments. Where does it come from? It 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 it. I think it it can't come from the people and their personal experiences. It must be influenced by media and politicians. I I don't know because it's it's normal that politicians try to find enemies abroad to put them in a, in a better position. Uh, uh, but it's, it's really astonishing to me that there is such a clear majority with general negative sentiments towards other countries. And my, my, uh, my second question uh, uh, would be, or a comment, um, Rifat said that uh, economy needs to be transparent and predictable. And I would not see the EU as a normative actor uh, I see the EU as an actor who really sticks to the fundamental rules to human, human rights and to the ruling of law. And if this is a normative actor, okay, call it normative actor. 
but this is predictable and transparent. And this is what economy needs. If we look, are looking for good and lasting economic relationships, we need this predictability uh, uh, um, that, 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 that companies can really plan their, their uh, strategies in, in their foreign markets. And uh, so I think there is, a, there is a link between what's politically needed and legally needed and what econ economy needs. Peter, thanks very much. So well, let's take that as our first, as our first two questions, actually. Uh, and please, if you'd like to pick up on them, uh, you know, why so negative towards international, international uh, neighbors, partners, the the international scene generally. So many negative responses. Uh, but secondly, um, this question of you know the EU as a the importance of it as a predictable actor promoting transparency, etc. Um, please, if you'd like to pick up on any any of those briefly. Shannon, please. May I? Please, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Ian. Thanks. Um, yeah, maybe about uh, Peter's question about why so many negative actors, you know, why so many, sorry, negative Views. perceptions or feelings towards third countries. I think there are a number of factors that feed into that. I do agree that it doesn't have to do with people's personal encounters with uh, you know, Europeans or citizens from other countries, etc. I think, first of all, it has a lot to do with political discourse and the predominant discourse, which is, of course, very heavy these days, but it also used to be present in the past, that Turks don't really have many friends around the world, that we have to fend it to ourselves. And of course, coupled with this is this fear that also draws from explicit references to historical experiences, right? in the late Ottoman era, you know, during the Republic that, you know, the, the West in particular does not harbor, um, you know, honest, um, I would say aspirations uh, towards Turkey. And they always have some kind of a hidden agenda that would always be to Turkish disinterest, um, uh, Turkish, you know, uh, against Turkish interests. So, um, and this is not something, you know, that's just been, um, you know, pushed down by the politicians, but it is something that's also trickled down society through education and various other channels. So there is, I mean, this is something that goes way along back and, uh, and it's quite rooted in society as I think the survey results also indicate. So that's where I see it uh, coming from. Now about, if I may perhaps say a few sentences about the second question or maybe Gunther would like to pick up on that since he mentioned it. Yeah, well, okay. so, I mean, I do agree in general that, of course, EU, it, it's good that EU still has some normative credibility in Turkey, uh, especially at a time when we are in the academic literature talking about the death of EU as a normative actor and the sort of the shift in the normative actor paradigm, etc. cetera. Um, but I think regarding Turkey, what really makes this normative influence work of course, yes, you know, perhaps partly through a revision of the customs union and having to adjust certain laws and regulations, as, as Peter also alluded to, because, you know, for economic relations to work, you need to, you know, make reforms in certain fields, etc. That also helps governance in general, but it has to go beyond that, right? And for that, I think the only way out is in the future, at some point, the revitalization of the accession perspective, however difficult it might be because I think that's the only thing that seems to work uh, and has worked in the past to get Turkey on the path towards democratic reform. Maybe not today, but in the future, yeah. Sure. Sinem, yeah. thank you Maybe very much. Maybe I would like to add or perhaps disagree, I don't know. <laughs> Go ahead, any, any, if anyone would like to pick up on that, otherwise there are, there are lots of interesting questions that have come in. Um, Okay, let me let me move along, and and some of them I'm forgive me uh, to those who've who've written in a lot of questions. I'm going to group some of them because a lot of them are on similar, uh, very interesting themes. A question of how what we have seen in the survey and what we've been discussing here relates to electoral politics in Turkey. You know uh, that for some of the people who've written, uh, there seems to be a disconnect between especially attitudes of youth and, and electoral results in Turkey, or perhaps to put it the other way, maybe we can look at these results and, and, and it may help us to say something about what we may see next in Turkish elections. So how do you, how do you read the results in the context of the, the sort of political scene inside Turkey? And, 
whoever would like to pick up on that. I mean, Kadri, if you'd like, or Gunter, please. Well, if I may say something on that, actually, uh, as you said, we, we can probably manipulate the, the next election, but it's really difficult to say uh, because the presidential election was two, three years ago, and uh, we had actually two years ago the local election, and it would be uh, probably this young group of uh, uh, from 18 and 24 years old, they also voted in the past, but uh, I think we should also think that the, the, how the economic situation evolved into the last two, three years and also the pandemic, how it played, because we didn't really speak about this, but it probably pandemic also played a lot. If we, we, we have done this survey uh, two years ago, probably the results will, they would have been different. And, but potentially, yes, I mean, on the, the future election, I don't know what the Senemoja think, but may potentially can play a role. Okay, good turn, please. Yeah, very short to what what Kadri said or what you asked. Yeah, you know, I think uh, the results of the of the of the uh, of the poll are much in line with uh, results of uh, polls that ask for election uh, election behavior or for uh, which which parties are in a way favorable uh, with the uh, population. Uh, we see that uh, the. Uh, Un, if unofficial ruling coalition because the AKP is in the is at the, at the is, 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 is the gov is in the government but it is supported by by the uh, MHP that this unofficial ruling coalition is uh, in decline when it comes uh, to, to voter to voters and it's particular the use that is turning uh, its back towards uh, the AKP and therefore this is full in line with uh, with uh, what the study presents us. Uh, a, a, a short word to uh, what uh, Senem said about the accession uh, perspective. Uh, we all, I think, would very much uh, hope or would, 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 would very much welcome uh, to have the accession process uh, revitalized. But I think we should be realistic and we should also uh, take uh, the uh, voters in Turkey and the Turkish population serious. And as we know, as at, at, at at least I think that the European Union, as it is today, uh, not able to uh, show a clear perspective for the smaller Western Balkans for membership, uh, it would be dishonest uh, to uh, talk about the possibility of Turkey to access the European Union. And therefore, I would very much argue for the creation of a new framework for Turkish-Europe relation, a framework that includes conditionality, it will be very difficult to, to, to construct this, but that is not going to argue with false, with false promises, because I think the European Union itself is not in, in the position to do it. And to give a, a very short or two very short uh, examples what I, what I have in mind. For example, when we, when we have now this talk uh, of the European Council of a phased reversible uh, policy towards, towards uh, Turkey. And why not make this more concrete? We saw, uh, and Senem rightly uh, drew uh, underlined uh, these, for me also surprising uh, result that there is a huge majority for signing the climate, the climate agreement, the Paris Climate Agreement. Why not making the ratification of the climate agreement by Turkey a precondition for European support in Turkey's endeavor to change its uh, energy outlook and its energy production? Why not make uh, the uh, implementation of the rules of the European Court of Human Rights a precondition for the much wanted high level dialogues of Turkey? Because these are understandable uh, demands, be it what I mentioned first, understandable in the context of the policy area, namely climate change and climate protection. And they are understandable in our own and uh, in our own wish to establish a rules-based relationship to Turkey with Turkey. But a rules-based relationship means that first the European Union has to formulate rules that are in a way acceptable to Turkey. And the European Union has to bind itself to the rules that it established and make them or its fulfillment by the European Union the uh, center of its policy towards Turkey. For Turkey, I think this would be welcomed. It would be welcomed by Democrats in Turkey. 
And I think it should also be welcomed by the Turkish government because it makes the European Union predictable. Turkey know, knows what is demanded, but it also can rely on actions of the European Union once these demands are fulfilled. Let me, there are a couple of questions that relate uh, to this. And again, I'm gonna sort of uh, paraphrase a little bit, but the recent sort of um, uh, cooling off in the brinkmanship in the Eastern Mediterranean, other things that have been at the center of the council debates and other things to do with EU-Turkish relations. Um, is this simply a kind of tactical modulation or is it, does it represent something more durable and more meaningful in terms of the Turkish approach and the approach from the from President Erdogan uh, and his government. Um, Cenem, please. Thank you, Ian. I'll come to your question, but can I just say, I mean, related to that, two things that I wanted to say in relation to what Ginter has mentioned and Kadri as well. Well, of course, I agree with both of them on the fact that we should never also discard the possibility of change in Turkey. You know, no one knows when, but I think, you know, this survey, these survey results and also other public opinion polls, which Ginter also mentioned, I think goes to show that there are, there's obviously very strongly changing societal dynamics. There's polarization, yes, but there's also a deeper societal change that's going on, especially among the younger generation, uh, which really, I think, should get the EU to think in a much longer term perspective about what to do, do with Turkey. And about, um, and having spoken of conditionality as well, I agree with Gunther, of course, um, but I think you also need to do two things in, you know, if you want to apply conditionality without accession in the near term, but also not excluding the possibility of it once things are normalized in Turkey or whenever that might be. But um, I think there too, I think there are two challenges or at least two mistakes that the EU is making. The first one is, I mean, look at the um, discussion about the revision of the customs union agreement, right? At first, it was tied to some kind of political conditionality, although not very explicitly, but it was well known that especially Germany was not unhappy with some of the, you know, uh, high profile cases, etc. And they, you know, without seeing any progress on those, that it was not going to um, give its green light to the uh, opening of the talks. Now, after what's happened in the Eastern Mediterranean, and this brings me to the Eastern Mediterranean issue, Ian, we see that uh, the customs union revision in the Council of uh, Summit Conclusions is now also tied, uh, tied to the resolution of the Cyprus issue. Now, that's another way of saying that this is never going to happen in the foreseeable future. So, and that's not the way in which, you know, you can exert any type of political conditionality. I think that's something that we need to underline. And secondly is, yes, of course, Paris Agreement. Yes, it could be, a, I think, an instrument of conditionality. And I personally would be in favor of it myself. But then why not tie it to a bigger reward, like making Turkey, and not just a reward for Turkey, but I think this would be good for the EU as well, you know, include Turkey in the EU's, you know, financial technical support for green transition in the neighborhood, right? This would be a much better reward because it means also money, assistance, the companies, et cetera. And that would be a better link to sort of, you know, go through the deadlock. So I think we need to be very careful in perhaps, you know, formulating these kind of policy connections. And, you know, more specifically, again, going back to the Eastern Mediterranean question, well, Ian, I mean, that's hard to tell, you know, I mean, it's very difficult to tell because, I mean, all of that sort of energy exploration, and I, because I think all that saga had not much to do with energy, but a lot to do with geopolitics. Um, so I can't say that they were really a part of the sort of big grand scheme of Turkish government or Turkish foreign policy, which then it could sort of help us to speculate a little bit more successfully on what the next steps would be. But because it's not that, it's very difficult to tell what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. um, it seems that for now, again, my hunch and my reading of the story is that, I mean, it looks like, you know, the sort of they will continue cooling off the tensions for a bit a bit longer, you know, by carrying all these exploratory talks and this and that, and play it a bit to time as well, because right now there is a lot of, there's a lot going on domestically in Turkey too, right? With all the pandemic and the state of the economy and a potential of, you know, future elections, et cetera. So 
Uh, I'm not sure that they will increase the pressure in the Eastern Mediterranean in the in the near future. And also right now, I think they have uh, bigger concerns about how to find the right balance between US and the EU on the one hand and Russia on the other, especially with what's happening in Ukraine. So um, I think, I mean, how that sort of plays out might have important ramifications on how Turkey will play the game in the Eastern Mediterranean, right? Because they might be pushed to a corner and make a decision on which direction to go for. Senem, thank you very much. And uh, there's another question, and it's also one that I wanted to follow up on. It relates directly to that. And maybe Kadri or Gunter, you might want to comment. Um, you know, among the list of things, you know, where Turkey would show flexibility or where respondents wished that Turkey would show flexibility in pursuit of a closer relationship with the European Union, uh, Cyprus and relations between Greece and Turkey were at the bottom, if I recall, uh, in terms of willingness to be flexible. Yet those are those are very much at the forefront of the agenda when it comes to how to improve the relationship. In the case of Cyprus, it's a, it's a prerequisite in a, in a sense, certainly for membership. How do you how do you explain that? What's the, what's the issue? Is it simply because it's been in the news and therefore people have a strongly nationalistic response to those issues? Or is there something else going on there? Kadri, Gunter, please. <laughs> Go ahead, Gunther, please. Go ahead, Gunther. You are the guest. <laughs> no, I, I don't. You are muted. You're muted, Gunther. Sorry. No. No, I don't. I don't want to talk too much. Uh, I think when it comes to to the Eastern Mediterranean, it's a, it's a very and everybody knows it's a very com a very complex picture, and everybody knows that both uh, Turkey and and Greece have put forward maximalist demands. I think we also agree that uh, in the time when uh, the EU was not able to formulate a policy towards Turkey and uh, Mr. Erdogan enjoyed uh, very uh, warm relations with Mr. Trump, Turkey found itself a great leeway for, for military, for, for, for an expansionist uh, policy. And uh, this has changed. And uh, at, at the same time, I see, I think we see that, and for me as a, as a, as a Particularly as a German, we, we are always very reluctant to acknowledge uh, that a military uh, might play a, a great deal in, in, in uh, foreign relations. But I think uh, the, uh, the government of Greece has, uh, has managed to build up an impressive uh, network of, uh, of uh, military and security cooperation with France, with Egypt, with the United Arab em Emirates. And uh, this, I think, has naturally contributed uh, to uh, Turkey's also more moderated policy uh, at the moment. And as far as as much maybe as uh, the new uh, stance of or the stance of the, of the Biden administration. And therefore, uh, this is, I think, the result for Turkey's more moderate policy uh, in the moment. I don't know if this goes align or the, of, if this also includes uh, a change in, in the strategic outlook. Of Turkey. I see a Turkish discourse in which uh, the future economic development of the country is very much uh, linked to uh, military capacity. And this reminds me a little bit at, at the French approach, where we, particularly in Africa, uh, also see this parallel thinking of, of military presence and, 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 and economic development. And I think this, uh, there should be, there should be, the European Union should work for a, a different visions of, of uh, economic uh, future development uh, in which uh, military deployments, uh, security uh, considerations are more constructed uh, from the perspective of a common European security and of a common security framework for the region, and not in, in the sense of uh, nationalist or, or of, of national of of, comp, comp, uh, uh, of, of com, com, sorry sorry for of com, competition between between the European nation states because this uh, weakens the European Union, makes it impossible that Europe is in a way uh, constructing its own. Uh, security policy and acts also as a reliable a partner of, of, the, of the US. Kadri, I mean, maybe just to, to comment on, on how you read that slide, you know, in the public response on those two issues, uh, Cyprus and the East Med. Well, I, I wasn't really surprised by this. I, I was 
even expecting a higher uh, rate on that. I mean, that the, the, I would think that the people, they, they don't, because uh, we don't, we shouldn't forget that actually the, 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 the support for the uh, ESMAD policy is going beyond the supporter of uh, government, actually, even in the, uh, within the, the actually opposition, the support for it, maybe the way of doing the politics would be different. For example, if there were uh, opposition, maybe they would uh, try to establish relation with Israel, Egypt, etc. But I don't think that the, the politics would change incredibly in the East Med. So in this sense, I am not, uh, I wasn't, I was a bit surprised that it could be even higher. But just let me say some point on this East Med issue, uh, Eastern Mediterranean tension. Uh, related to the, this positive agenda that we are speaking about, right? Actually, what was interesting when we, uh, from, uh, you know, uh, Borel and Commission report, the, the conclusion of the Council uh, in la last March, actually, the ISMA tension was a kind of prerequisite for advancing in the relations. And, but in Ankara, we saw that actually the president of commission and council, they brought again, and I think it was a bit pressure coming from the parliament or different uh, uh, EU segments, a kind of reaction that to the, this pressure obliged them to bring back, at least mention the human rights issue, etc. in Turkey. What was in, this was interesting. And last point on the ISMAT, why Turkey now is, th there is this, uh, uh, escalation in the East Med. Of course, many reasons has been said. I agree with all of them. But we shouldn't forget that actually Turkey is the exclusion from this uh, game in the East Med uh, was uh, pushing Turkey to this, let's say, more proactive policy to kind of pressure uh, Greece to come to the table, but also uh, to, to bring Turkey to the center of this game. And I think in, in some extent, it's, it's, it was successful. But then, uh, continuing to do the military activities, exploration, that is, nothing is coming out of this. So you should, at some point, uh, uh, stop this kind of... Uh, I think this was probably the, 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 the reason. Thank you. Agreed. Thank you very much. Um, I'm conscious of our time. Um, and, but I did want to maybe get to a, a question, uh, an interesting one, which relates to our topic very closely. Uh, and maybe maybe it's especially for 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 Gunter and for Peter. Perhaps you, you'll hear it. Um, it has to do with the uh, with the future of German politics in relation to this. I mean, if the Greens come into government, um, what difference is this likely to make in terms of Germany's very critical approach within the European Union towards Turkey? Critical in the sense of being important. I mean, there's a degree of pragmatism. I think we'll agree has characterized this. Are we in for a more values-driven approach uh, on anything from arms uh, sales to other issues if, uh, if the Greens are part of government or even perhaps leading one? If you want to speculate on this front. <laughs> go ahead, uh, Gunter or Peter. Peter, Peter, Peter should go ahead. Peter, Peter, please. Let's, let's speculate uh, a bit. Uh, if, if the Greens come in, I think uh, uh, they will focus more on, on uh, really uh, human rights and ruling of law uh, uh, with all our partners. I think, uh, and it, it might happen that the perspective of, uh, uh, of uh, acquisition will be reopened. What, what, what was said, the revitalization. And I, I share the view of Mr. Seufer that we should be realistic. But if we looked in, wirklich in a long-term perspective, we should not close any door. Nobody knows what happens. I, I remember uh, 1990, 1989, when, when, the, when the Berlin Wall fell down, nobody had expected this. And it really, it changed everything in the world. And uh, uh, nobody knows what history brings. So my, my clear position is, and I think the Greens would support this, not to close the door, but to make Turkish people more aware that only a healthy European Union 
would be a good partner and it would be worthwhile to become a member in a healthy European Union. And we should openly discuss our current difficulties. I was in the federal government as a director general in the labor ministry, negotiated the Maastricht Treaty. And we had this discussion about deepening and enlargement. And it was said, first, we have to deepen the European Union as a political union. And then we can speak about enlargement. And then they, they change these political positions by saying it's, it's ju just two sides of the same medal. And, and then we got the enlargement without deepening. And we have the problems now that we, that we did not deepen the European to a real political uh, uh, union. For, from my side, I personally would say we need qualified majority voting in foreign and, and security politics in the European Union, but ask the foreign ministries of the member states and the diplomats whether they really would uh, give in there and, and really put competence together in the European Union. But without doing this, I think enlargement for any new member is unrealistic. But once we, we are successful to get a more healthy European Union again by deepening us, by really changing some rules, uh, 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 for example, qualified majority voting in foreign fo policy, I think then uh, we, we really can start new discussions uh, uh, also about enlargement of the European Union. But this will take more than a generation to be realistic again. This will take time for more than, than a generation. So when I saw in the polls, those who thought Turkey could become a member within five years or, t or 10 years, uh, this, is, this is completely nonsense to, to be clear, but it's, it's interesting to know that people believe in this. So not before 20, 30 years, but history is an open end uh, um, process and we should not close the door. I think Turkey is too important also in geopolitical terms as if we should really close the door. And so I'm, I'm really favorable for uh, a revitalization, but based on realistic expectations. And I think the Greens would support such a general tendency. Mm -hmm. Good, Jerry, any last thought on that question? Very short, very short. I fully agree with what Peter has said. I think the Greens will be much more, much more critical when it comes to arms sales, when it comes to human rights, when it comes to women's rights. Uh, but they, at the same time, will be more uh, forthcoming when there is really a change in Turkish politics because they are not uh, in, the, in a more in a culturalist mood and they would not reject uh, closer relations uh, to Turkey due to arguments of cultural strangeness, uh, religious differences, and, and, and this kind of, of stuff that played a crucial role uh, in the failed membership process. I'm going to thank you very much. I mean, it turns out that this is a very interesting question to, to end our conversation on, because I think it opens up a whole uh, other set of issues that we can be discussing over the coming months, for sure. Um, let me uh, thank you all. Uh, Senem, Gunter, Peter, uh, Thanks to Rifat Bey again for being with us. Our, our great thanks to TOBB for being part of this event, but also for the ongoing cooperation, uh, which has allowed us to do all sorts of wonderful things. And those wonderful things have largely been the result of my colleague uh, Kadri. And uh, very special thanks to you for this uh, research and, and for the program as a whole. Uh, big thanks to my colleagues, Annika and Alberto, also for making this happen. Um, and our thanks to all of you for joining us. Um, let me just maybe end with one final uh, question to you, Kadri, because a couple of people wrote about it in the Q&A. Will the studies be out and available for people to see and how? Yes, absolutely. It will be on the, our website, GMF website, actually, they can't find there. So, and they're there, all, they're there already? or ex I think that it's just process, it's, very, it's very coming. Good. Real. <laughs> yeah. Coming yeah, soon, coming, su coming soon, coming yeah, soon to our Very, very soon. So. Let me also, Ian, just by this occasion, to thank my colleagues in Ankara that they incredibly work together on that, Özgür and uh, Jaylan, incredibly co contributed incredibly on this work, actually we realized all this together and by this occasion, thank you. Thank Abs you. Absolutely, absolutely right. 
again, thanks to all of you. Thanks for the wonderful conversation. Thanks to all the people who joined us and for your questions. I'm sorry I couldn't get to all of them, but the next time. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you again soon at GMF. And a very good uh, evening or afternoon to all of you. Thanks. All right.